Good morning. Welcome to the 17th Surface Ventures webinar and welcome to, to our first uh, webinar of 2022. Uh, before we go any further, can you please write where you're joining us from today in the chat box on the right hand side. And while you're doing that, um, my name is Tahid Khan. I'm a, a Vice President at Surface Ventures and I'm your host for today. Uh, we are a non-for-profit organization and our mission is to provide world-class surface engineering education for academia and industry. So every month we aim to bring you a, a sector leading speaker to present the current challenges and future trends in surface engineering. Alongside surface engineering uh, workshops uh, and live equipment demonstration. Great, that seems to be uh, working. Many great places there. Um, so today it's my ple pleasure to introduce Dr. Dichu uh, Sue, who will be discussing mechanical characterization of super soft hydrogels. Uh, Dr. Sue now works on an EU funded uh, medical device obligations task force, which aims uh, EU project, uh, which aims to develop the latest hydrogel coatings for excellent tribological performance in total hip replacements. Um, expertise and research interests include nano indentation on soft biomaterials, friction on wear of hydrogel coatings, numerical mo uh, modeling of contact mechanics, uh, boundary location, uh, Raman spectroscopy, and in situ tribal chemistry processes. So in terms of, uh, of an agenda, we'll start with Dr. Sue's presentation, which will last approximately uh, 30 minutes and, followed, and it will be followed by uh, a question and answer um, session. We will then switch over to our partner, Micromaterials, and Professor Ben Beek, who will be introducing the NanoTest, uh, Tribal Test module for the NanoTest platform. Um, and this will be followed by uh, another qu question and answer session. A quick note on questions, please type these into the chat box and they'll be marked for question and answer, for the question and answer session. Um, we are planning to go for around 60 minutes today in total. However, depending on questions, uh, this may go over slightly, so we do apologize if this happens. Um, there will be a quick GDP, GDPR uh, announcement. Um, there'll be a few brochures, brochures available from uh, our partner, um, Micromaterials. And if you download one of these, someone from, uh, from Micromaterials um, may get in touch with you. Um, a reminder about our website, which is surfaceventures.org. It features videos from our previous talks, information regarding upcoming webinars, and information about the Surface Ventures team. Um, as always, we always like to know a little bit about you, our audience. So there'll be a quick poll appearing on your screen very soon. Um, can, as previous events, can you please answer the question that has just popped up? Uh, which of these best describes your current position? Great, we have a nice mixture of PhD students and undergraduates. So um, now what I'd like to do is hand over to our uh, speaker for today, uh, Dr. Sue. Dr. Sue, over to yourself. Thank you, Tahid. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon or good evening. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about testing on the uh, mechanical properties of the super soft hydrogels using the latest uh, uh, nano orientation technique. So the hydrogel materials have the three dimensional extracellular matrix, which consists of a solid elastic skeleton and a large amount of water inside. And because of this unique uh, three-dimensional structure, it has some excellent mechanical properties. Uh, for example, it can, uh, it can have some large deformations when you stretch the gels, but it will resume to the original shape and size after stretching. And it contains large amount of water inside the matrix, but will not dissolve in the water and it can hold themselves. And it can be safe to use in the human body as it, most of them are biocompatible and uh, 
biodegradable. And you can, uh, the important thing that is you can change the stiffness uh, quite easily via external stimuli, like you can change the temperature, the chemical environment, the pH air values and uh, lights. So it got a wide range of applications in the biomedical devices uh, in the human bodies. But the major challenge here is that how you can precisely control the mechanical properties to uh, meet your specific clinical needs. And uh, before that, uh, obviously, you, uh, you need to measure the mechanical properties uh, accurately. Um, but the problem is that there's still lack of standards uh, for testing these soft materials, even though there are several uh, mechanical uh, testing methods uh, to test the softer materials uh, in different length scale, like you use the FM-based nanoimitation test on, uh, in the nanometer range, and uh, the nanoimitation test can test in the micro range, just between the FM-based nanoimitation and the micro indentation. And there are some conventional testing methods, like the compression testing and tensile testing, you used to, to uh, test uh, in the millimeter range, in the micro range. So it is not a new thing to test uh, these softer materials, but what we found here is that uh, even for the same materials, the testing results can be very different when using different techniques and testing on a different length scale. Uh, so uh, what we wondering is uh, what caused these discrepancy in the results when you're testing on a different length scale using different techniques uh, especially for some uh, super soft materials then how can we measure more accurately uh, for these materials and for the another indentation technique uh, it can test in the micro range so it is good for correlating the mechanics with the material microstructure. Um, and for the nano orientation techniques, uh, we usually validate the measurements using a reference material, like we use fused silica for um, validate the measurements uh, for the hard materials. But uh, the problem for the, these super soft materials is that there is no reference uh, softer, softer materials that we could use to validate these measurements. So we are wondering that how we can determine the measurements are correct if there's no such reference material. And also the uh, hydrogens show some time dependent behaviors such as the viscoelasticity and pore elasticity. So um, which requires more sophisticated models when uh, for the data analysis processing after testing. So we're wondering that uh, how the results can be changed when we use different techniques, like using the Oliver method or the Hertz models or other time-dependent models. So to answer these questions, uh, we utilize the soft contact protocol in the nano test advantage system from micromaterials to uh, test on some super soft gels and the samples were immersed in the PBS solution at room temperature when testing them uh, using the liquid cell. Uh, for nano indentation technique, uh, the important thing is to uh, determine the zero point or you can call it inertial contact point uh, before testing. And for a standard test, uh, the system will bring the tip uh, into contact with the sample. And when a tiny load like 10 micronewton load is detected by the system, then the system will automatically register this location as the inertial point contact. And this will be going to use to determine the contact area uh, for the data analysis. Uh, this tiny load, like 10 micronewton, is not uh, 
is not a problem for testing on hard materials, uh, but for the softer materials, especially for some softer, super softer materials in the single kilopascal range, uh, this tiny load will cause the tip already uh, like several microns into the sample before testing. So that means the uh, determination of the zero point is not correct and obviously the contact area determination is not uh, correct as well. So the softer uh, contact group will uh, resolve this problem by removing this automatic zero point determination and it also allows the user to collect the data before the tip touches the surface. So you can see that this horizontal line, uh, which means the tip is moving towards uh, to the sample uh, without touching the surface, but you can select the zero point manually after testing is done and use this to um, determine your contact area and the elastic moduli in the data analysis. So the softer contact uh, protocol allows the user to determine the zero point more accurately, and uh, which means more accurate determination on the contact area and elastic moduli. So, um, so we manufactured uh, some low cross-linking polyethylene glycol uh, hydrogels to see if the softer contact protocol uh, enable to differentiate these super soft gels in the single kilopascal range. Um, so we have um, these reduced modulus uh, calculated here. Like we get these uh, reduced modulus from three uh, different levels of cross linking of hydrogens and the three different levels of con concentration of the hydrogens. And you can see that result shows uh, the nano annotation enables to uh, give repeatable and uh, reasonable uh, values in the single kilopascal range, which is fills the measurement gap identified here uh, in the micro range, as there were not many studies uh, demonstrate that the uh, nano annotation technique is capable of differentiating the super soft gels uh, in this low modulus range. So we use the three different um, data analysis methods uh, and the black one is the olive method, the red one is the Hertz model and also the blue one is the viscoelastic model to investigate that how the results can be changed when different models used uh, for the data analysis. And you can see that the olive of our method produce higher reduced modulus compared to the Hertz model and the viscoelastic model. And this is because the olive of our method is analyzing the unloading curve while the Hertz model is analyzing the loading curve then there is hysteresis between the unloading and loading due to the viscoelastic behavior of the hydrogens. So we perform the viscoelastic model in order to encounter the viscoelastic behavior of the uh, gels. And we get even lower reduced modulus values when we use the viscoelastic model. Uh, this is because the uh, due to the creep behavior of the, the gels, the contact area uh, calculated from the viscoelastic model is, is lower than the uh, Hertz model. So we got uh, even lower equilibrium reduced modulus uh, produced by the viscoelastic model instead of the instant reduced modulus pro uh, provided by the Hertz model, as the Hertz model only considered the, the the loading curve, not the creep. So for the, uh, so how we can validate these measurements uh, using the soft contact routine in the nano test advantage system, as we mentioned before that we don't have a reference material uh, for soft materials we can use to validate these measurements in the 
single kilopascal range. Uh, so we designed a new calibration method. Uh, the idea is instead of indenting uh, some softer materials, we bending these long cantilever beams. And these long cantilever beams, we have already known its uh, properties. So we can calculate the bending stiffness of these long cantilever beams. Then we measure the bending stiffness using the soft contact routing uh, in the nano initiation system. Uh, so we compare the measurements from these tests with the calculations to see if the measurements are reasonable in this low kilopascal range. Um, then the because the uh, we can change the bending stiffness of the cantilever beams uh, by changing by using different lengths of the cantilever beams. So we produce a range of bending stiffness, and you can see that all the uh, the straight lines is, is is denoting the calculations, and they all matched uh, well with the non-annotation curves at different uh, stiffness levels. So we are producing a range of uh, bending stiffness from the cantilever beams by changing the length of the cantilever beam. And we're measuring uh, these stiffness as well, and it agrees with the calculations. And also we are covering the measurement range uh, for the flexures, uh, for the bending stiffness from five uh, to zero point five new, uh, newton per meter, so it's uh, it's a very low stiffness level we are measuring now, and we also compare the bending stif stiffness we measured from the cantilever beam with the contact stiffness we. Uh, we investigate on these uh, soft gels. Like you can see that the, the black curve uh, denotes the, the nano indentation curves from these super soft gels in the single cube Pascal range, which is matches uh, with the uh, bending stiffness we get from the cantilever beams, which means the, the uh, the bending stiffness we measured from the cantilever beams uh, is in the same level, uh, same stiffness level with the contact stiffness we measure on these uh, hydrogels. So, which means we need enable to validate these uh, measurements in the single kilopascal range. So, uh, the reason that the uh, nano test advantage system enable us to measure the stiffness in this low range is that uh, we found the flexural, uh, flexural stiffness of this system is very low. It's just a 10 times uh, lower than, uh, com than the other commercial available uh, nano annotation system. So if the flexural stiffness of a uh, nano annotation system is, is high, it's like 100 uh, Newton per meter, which is uh, much higher than the interactions between the tip, uh, tip and the sample. You can see the contact stiffness is quite low as uh, 0 0.5. So, uh, it, which means the, 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 the system with high flexural stiffness uh, will not detect the minor change in the contact stiffness uh, in this circumstance. So the nano test advantage system has a low, much lower flexural stiffness, which enables uh, the system can uh, differentiate the super soft uh, materials with the contact stiffness is in low range, like 0 0.5. So uh, there are some conclusions uh, in this study that we managed to use the nanotest advantage system, uh, the soft contact routine in the nanotest advantage system to uh, enable us to differentiate some super soft gels in the single kilopascal range. And we also validate these measurements in the single kilopascal range using a new calibration method 
like measuring the bending stiffness of the cantilever beams, which is equivalent to the contact stiffness we're measuring on these, <coughs> sorry, on these softer gels. And we also investigate how the uh, time dependent behavior, uh, in, in this case, the viscoelastic behavior of the hydrogels could uh, influence on the results we obtained. So we compared three modeling uh, here, which is the OP method and Hertz model and viscoelastic analysis. And the uh, OP method produced higher reduced modulus than Hertz than the viscoelastic uh, models. So um, this is all about this work, and we thank the we appreciate the kind of discussion with Adrian Harris from Micromaterials when we carry about uh, out this work, and we also uh, thank our colleague from uh, City Tech in Spain, uh, who is also working on the MDOT project, this EU pro, uh, EU European project. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ditu. So what we'll do at this point, we'll take some questions. Yeah. Hopefully they should appear on the screen. Um, how do you measure the time dependencies of hydrogels? Oh, it's, uh, we we uh, capture the creep uh, curve from the nano uh, uh tests, and we using the empirical fitting equation to the creep curve, which is based on the uh, Kelvin vehicle model. So we uh, can calculate the maximum depths based on the time dependent behavior of the viscoelastic uh, hydrogels. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, how do you decide on the amount of pressure for uh, viscoelastic measurements? Uh, sorry, the multi-pressure. Uh, how do you decide on the amount of pressure to, uh, that is used for the fiscal elastic measurements? Uh, I not quite understand this question, but I think uh, uh, because the the mechanics of the gels uh, is is changing, so uh, I assume uh, we use trials test to uh, define the which pressure is uh, is appropriate to test on some super soft gels and uh, yeah we we did uh, quite a few trial tests to to figure out uh, which the contact pressure is is good to use sure so our next question um do you think microindentation would be more appropriate for soft gels? Um, yeah, the because the microindentation has a, a much larger contact area, so it will bring down the contact pressure, uh, so it will not uh, damage the super soft gels when you're testing. But uh, it will also, uh, I think, it depends on the, uh, the, the the case you are investigating because in 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 this case, we are more uh, quite interested in uh, the microstructure of the materials. So uh, we uh, we think that the microindentation might uh, could miss that uh, microstructure when the testing length scale is larger than the microstructure. Sure, great. Yeah. And the next question, it's an interesting one. Do you think hydrogels would be useful in the field of lubricants? Can you elaborate about the tribological behavior? Great question. Yeah, uh, that is something we're investigating right now uh, about the tribological performance of these hydrogels. And uh, some, in some cases, the hydrogels is very uh, lubricious and you can uh, use it to get a better uh, tribological, tribological performance. But sometimes the hydrogen is more like uh, helps the well reduction uh, but i think that uh related to the mechanical properties uh like the poor elastic of the gels and they can like uh 
hold a little bit of contact pressure when the gel is sitting on, on the surface when you contact uh, when you pressure the two surfaces together. Sure. Our next question: uh, Can the gel sample be mounted steadily uh, in this vertical position? Uh, yeah, um, not a problem, uh, like not a issue for us because we use the super glue to, uh, yes, to stick the gels uh, on on the sample stuff. Uh, some case you can uh, just uh, polymerize uh, polymerize the gels on the glass uh, slide and stick the slide to the vertical sample stuff as well. And so it's not a real issue that we are encounter. Yeah. Right. Next question. Is the nano test uh, Vantage currently commercially equipped with this setup for measuring the mechanics of soft hydrogels or is it still in the experimental stage? Yeah, we have uh, uh, successfully uh, testing on these uh, super soft gels, so it's it's good to go to use. Great, and uh, I believe um, yeah. someone from so Adrian, Adrian from yeah someone from uh, Microbaterials has answered the question in the chat yeah. box. Please do refer to that. So on that note, I, I don't believe there's any more questions. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, one question has come in. The final question, I believe. Um, do you think this method would be uh, appropriate for harder viscoelastic materials such as rubber to determine the mechanical properties of the modified surface layer? Uh, yes, I think so. And uh, I think I'm not sure the rubber uh, will need to use the softer contact routine, but yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's. Uh, modified surface layer yeah great and i think that's all the questions so i just want to thank you again did you really appreciate thank your time you. and your presentation it was great um so thank you everyone for your questions on that note we're going to move on to our partner micromaterials and professor ben beek who will be introducing um the nano tribal test module uh, for the nano test platform um, so on that note uh, ben i'll hand over to yourself Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody. So something slightly different now. We're going to talk about uh, some tribology. And I introduce our new um, multi-sensing nanotribological test that we call uh, the nanotribo test, which we've integrated with contact resistance and friction measurement. So, excuse me. So why are we interested in single asperity tribology? Well, you've heard from Dishu about the importance of length scale in measurements and particularly with some of the questions that uh, towards the end as well about how you're sensitive to structure on different scales and also whether you're um, staying in the viscoelastic regime or whether you're having viscoplasticity is going to complicate the measurements in, in her example case. Um, so I'll introduce why we are focusing on single asperity or micro or nano tribology um, for friction and wear testing, why we're integrating multi-sensing te test techniques, and I'll introduce this new capability for reciprocating nano wear that we've called the nano tribo test. And I'll introduce some results on um, a range of um, DLC based coatings on hardened tool steel, give some results on some common biomaterials, um, 316 stainless steel and titanium 6.4, and then I'll finish off by showing how we've integrated some electrical contact resistance measurement capability, and we've used that to look at um, the uh, behavior of multi-layer thin films and uh, noble metals in sliding uh, electrical connector systems. So one of the main reasons for being interested in single asperity tribology is that you can simplify the complex uh, contact conditions that occur when you're, when you're um, doing a conventional um, macro scale tribological test, it's very difficult to get access to the real contact pressures driving the transformations. And this is because the, um, 
the true contact only occurs between the peaks of the asperities on the on the surface and on, on the slider so consequently the real area of contact is a much smaller fraction uh, of the apparent area of contact so they're locally much higher pressures and we can simulate those locally high pressures by um, using our nano test vantage system to do nano or micro scale scratch tests and we're using the diamond tip as the hard asperity under precisely controlled conditions. And that's particularly useful for testing uh, thin coatings in a range of different biomaterials and other systems. So there's a very nice schematic that you can see here from Kathy Vial and Greg Sawyer a few years ago now. So we're also interested in multi-sensing test techniques because that allows us to, that approach allows us to improve our sensitivity to the onset of wear processes and also to improve our mechanistic un understanding of friction and wear processes. So here's an example um, about how we've in, uh, improved our multi-sensing test uh, capability. And this is one of the modules for the nano test. In this case, it's an integrated acoustic emission sensing system, which allows us to monitor that acoustic emission throughout our test at very high um, frequency. And this high sensitivity system allows us to detect um, weak subsurface cracking that otherwise we wouldn't necessarily um, see. So here's an example of that. In this case, it's um, a ramp load scratch test on a silicon carbonitride coating on silicon with a 10 micron and radius ferroconical diamond. And the load increases from left to right. And at point B marks where the the first cracks are, are seen on the surface of, the, of that coating system. Before that, it's just plastic deformation at the surface. Um, but if you, in the acoustic emission re record, you can see there that actually at point A, um, much, much earlier in the track, there's a burst of acoustic emission. And that's because in this case, there's subsurface fracture going on. And um, the researchers in this case, Olomoc, uh, we're able to prove that by doing a, a focused iron beam cross section at that point and showing that was the exact point at which the first subsurface crack appeared. So it's a very powerful test technique. They wouldn't have known to look there had it not been for the acoustic emission test uh, capability. So as another example, in this case, this is a normal um, output from a repetitive impact test. In this case, it's a repetitive impact test. Um, with a cube corner indenter on a technical ceramic alumina and in this case after about 10 or so impacts there's a, a, an abrupt change in depth and we can assume of course that this might be related to fracture um, but indeed if we monitor the acoustic emission while doing the test we can see there's an abrupt um, burst of acoustic emission directly corresponding to that fracture process and again, you can use focused arm beam tests to reveal the subsurface cracking. So it's a couple of examples of where we've used multi-sensing within our standard vantage system. And now we wanted to expand that approach to our new module. So our new module for reciprocating nanoware, uh, to, which really adds to the capability of uh, tests available in the vantage system. So it, it allows us to do these high cycle, rapid linear reciprocating wear tests, which can be very small track lengths, but equally they can be very large track lengths up to about um, 40 millimeters. And we, as I say, we can combine this with um, contact resistance measurements, for example, which allows us to give this multi-sensing uh, test capability. So the example on the right, you can see how that, that new stage is integrated into the Vantage system. And it's illustrated in this case with a 25 micron n radius probe but of course you can put whatever probe in there that you like and design exactly the tribo test that you're interested in looking at so this extends the um, range of capability of the nano tribology modules and the vantage system so here we've got a comparison showing how um, scratch and fretting compare with uh, the tribo test and what we're able to do with the tribo test typically is to go to larger, larger contact um, sizes and higher sliding speeds 
and uh, longer sliding distances and that's that really allows us to access much much higher total sliding distances compared to what we might achieve in a in a fretting test or in a small scale repetitive scratch test and this this improves the um, practical correlation with um, tests such as MEMS, MEMS devices and looking at micro tribology of bioconnect and materials and electrical connectors etc so this is the sort of data that you might get off off uh, the system this is on the left on the left you can see the raw friction uh, signal against sliding distance uh, and you can see in this case that um, going just over those sort of about seven or so um, sliding cycles you can see there's an increase in friction and what we can do in the software and what the software does is it allows us to generate from this raw data friction loops as you can see there's um, an example on the right there from four different cycles taken within a, um, a 500 cycle test where you can see at some point uh, these are before and after a, a transition in friction frictional wear and we can also get information as well as friction but also energy dissipation information and as by the equation shown there again this is all all integrated into the nanotest software system so I say it's it's particularly useful to run these high cycle tests. Um, this is an example on some an, an undoped diamond like carbon coating system, a silicon doped diamond like carbon coating system, and, and a, a tungsten doped diamond like carbon system. All of which have been tested at 500 millinewtons with a 25 micron radius probe, a half a millimeter a second reciprocating sliding, and what we can see. At the beginning of the test is that these these three coating systems all on hardened tool steel behave almost identically so they have the same frictional coefficient around 0 0.09 but as you run the test on you can see completely different behavior in each of these cases um, and you can understand that in terms of um, third body effects plowing um, film failure etc you can look at these things in more detail and really understand how these coating systems fail and then and then move, move on to optimizing the systems to avoid the failure. So if we take um, one of these coating systems, so in this case, this is the undope system, and we run um, three different repeat tests in the system. So all of them show broadly the same behavior, whereas after a relatively low initial friction, then there's a jump with over a few cycles, and then the friction is much higher. But actually, if we also look in this, this test number one, you can see they're much more jagged uh, frictional signal so something slightly different has occurred in that test and we can ex investigate that a little bit further with with some SEM measurements and in this case um, we can see here that there's actually partial fracture that's occurred during uh, some of the regions of that uh, wear track and you can see that partial fracture has re revealed some of the sub layers and, and told you essentially that there's a um, most of that failure is occurring between um, the tungsten layer and the chrome, um, tungsten tote layer and the chromium bond layer in that system. So that is, is pointing to a point of weakness that uh, potentially the um, coating design can use to improve the system. So during that test on DLC, we saw a sort of relatively small increase in friction over a few cycles. This is a much more dramatic change in friction as those that work in titanium um, will know that the tribology of titanium can be particularly problematic. And in this example here, we're looking at a, a, a 100 millinewton test, 500 cycle test. And this is just at the beginning of that test. There's about sort of 20 cycles there. And we can see the friction is very low for the first few cycles. And then suddenly over a period of about three or four cycles, we get this abrupt transition to a higher friction and also to a friction where the scatter is much higher. So something clearly is going on. So we can investigate that a little bit further. First of all, we looked at um, how that behavior occurred uh, at different uh, load levels. So in this case, we're looking at both energy dissipation as well as friction and also the cumulative, cumulative energy dissipation. And what we can see, I don't know if you can quite make it out at the scale, here, but is um, essentially 
Below about 40, about 40 uh, millinewtons and below, there's a low friction regime, low energy dissipation, but at, high, at higher load, you're seeing these um, high cumulative energies and there's an abrupt transition towards this high friction um, contact where a lot of energy is dissipated in that in sliding. So this is an example now looking in terms of friction and then contrasting that titanium alloy with the behavior on a um, commercial 316 stainless steel. And then uh, you're just comparing 30 millinewtons and 50 millinewtons, and we can see essentially on the steel, the friction is low throughout. This is just focusing on the first 100 cycles. But for the titanium, slightly higher friction initially at um, at 50 millinewtons, and then there's an abrupt change to this high friction regime. And this abrupt change to the high friction regime results in high wear as well. So this is an example here. You can contrasting the amount of um, wear that occurs on these on these two um, coating systems. So again, this is from the uh, test sample data. So you have a depth sensing capability as well as friction. So the um, SEM really confirms that abrupt change in behavior that occurs in this test. And what we can see that's happening essentially is that um, the passive oxide film on the surface of the titanium 64 is protecting the underlying alloy in the reciprocating test at, at 40 millinewtons. But as the temp, as the load goes up, it's unable to um, to protect anymore, and you get this heavily oxidized tribologically transformed zone um, that occurs, and that's what's leading to these high wear and also these these high friction. So you can also see there's um, EDX there showing oxygen enhancement in, in the wear track. So this is the sort of thing that um, you could do to improve the, the um, behavior of titanium alloys. It's very localized, as, as was discussed earlier. This ability to test on small scales allows you to really understand the influence of microstructure, for example, on these type of events that, that where you would totally miss that by testing at larger scale. So I'll just finish off with some um, comments about um, where um, this is some work I done by my colleague Adrian, and Adrian's looked at um, integrating electrical contact resistance measurements, and here he switched away from the, uh, the standard diamond towards conductive um, metallic probes, and um, using either um, steel or, or noble metal alloys as sliding contacts. And we have a, a large, very large uh, stability in the system, and that allows us to run these extended tests and to record data, friction and contact resistance over these extended times. So we can really start to potentially look at lower pressure contacts, really um, start to simulate the sort of um, contacts that might occur in service. And in, in, in one case, at least, we were able to slide over this, these very large distances. So. First of all, we looked uh, at a multi-layered thin film stack um, for electrical sliding connector. And in this case, this has been tested with a, a one mil steel balls at, at a relatively low load. And we're recording the friction and contact resistance. And the sort of questions we're interested in understanding was which of those two um, signals is more sensitive to our failure of the coating system? What is, what is the extent of correlation? And when, it, and when the, um, the coating does fail, how does that failure evolve? Does it occur all at one, one place or does it occur uh, in a scratch test? For example, you might have failure over a, a part of the track, but then a couple of uh, scratches later to, for example, the whole track is totally failed. So we really wanted to understand that. So this is um, quite a complicated slide, so I'll talk you through this slowly. So what we see here, is four different snapshots during the test. And we're looking at the friction and contact resistance as a function of sliding distance. So each of them is um, catching um, seven, seven sliding um, trace and retrace steps. And in the first 280 um, 
millimeters of sliding in this case. There were no um, electrical contact resistance excursions at all. So totally electrically um, didn't fail at all. What we see here is just after about 345 um, millimeters, we're starting to see these slight spikes. And then we run the test on a little bit, we're getting these isolated failures and these um, slightly higher, well, much higher contact resistance and maybe slightly higher. So it's starting to get a few little frictional spikes as well. We run the test on uh, again to um, towards 490 millimeter sliding and we're seeing again. Um, the failure is still very localized. And if you run it on um, a lot further, you can see then you're getting progressive failure on over a large part of the track, but not all of the track. So it's quite complicated from these sort of pictures to really understand what's what's going on. So what we've done is we've developed a method where we can take the raw electrical contacts resistance uh, signal, um, which is shown there for one of the, for the for this test uh, as a function of cycles, where we can see the sort of uh, um, gradually increasing through the test, and we you might be able to suggest where roughly where the sample starts to fail, but it's not entirely clear. But we've developed something where just like with the friction, we can also um, generate the mean contact resistance over a sliding um, cycle. And that process allows us really to start to, to understand the level of correlation between these um, two signals and also to really understand how that failure evolves breaking through the different layers in that multi-layer system. So in this case, you can see after about 35 um, cycles, you can see the friction is starting to go up by 40 cycles, then you, you um, and then you're getting these increases and then there's an abrupt change in friction at 45 cycles and it's correlating with the uh, contact resistance. So this is on a thin film system. Um, bulk materials are, are potentially even more complicated. So I'll just give you one example um, of that, but this is a, um, an overview from a, from a, um, a very long test. And here you can see um, it's, it's a silver sliding against still silver. And you can see there's a couple of um, spikes in friction coefficient and, and contact resistance. And I think what's happening there is that the oxide debris um, generated, is, these are silver alloys with some, some oxygen in there, um, is, is, is trapped in the contact, but eventually it's working its way through so that by the end of the test, you're back in that sort of low contact resistance, low friction regime. So this again is the sort of thing where you can design some clever tests to get you a lot more understanding about different alloy behavior. So to sum up, hopefully I've given you a, a flavor of just some of the potential of this new um, capability that we have, which we call the nanotribo test. So it's commercially available as, as another module to go alongside the um, scratch um, fretting indentation and impact with the in the nanotest vantage system. And it comes with this automatic recording of friction loops, cumulative, cumulative energy dissipation, electrical contact resistance, and how these vary as a function of cycles. And because the load head uh, design is the same, it, it retains this high lateral rigidity design, which is particularly um, useful, that provides this stability to perform these extended nanoware tests. And I think there's some great potential in, in improving our understanding of uh, wear mechanisms by these multi-sensing approaches. And in, this, in the example shown here, we're able to see how contact resistance and friction were, were tightly correlated. Okay, I think, um, I think maybe I have one more. Yes, yeah, so um, feel free to, um, to look at these two papers here, which have more detail about these, the, the, the results I've described in this presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that, Ben. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll take some questions. I believe that there are some questions in the chat. Okay, excuse me. So the first question is, uh, in, in the scratch test, how do you avoid picking up acoustic emissions from the various mechanisms associated with applying the load and uh, translation? Is it sim simply a case of high pass? Um, sorry. Uh, high pass filtering um well it possibly this is one of the reasons why it's more um 
I didn't say, but it, the acoustic emission sensor is is on the is behind the sample, which may give us an advantage for that that type of um, avoiding that type of problem where um, there might be another answer to that. But essentially, um, I guess it's they probably also different frequencies as well. So, so I, I sort of hinted at sort of I only really showed um, the single frequency. Um, I guess would you call it the, the sort of overwhelming envelope of, but there's a lot more data data processing that can be done, and you could easily. Um, I don't think you need to do high pass filtering, but you could easily um, work out what was associated with different different. If, um, if anything was coming from the loading side, you would you would be able to pick that up because it would be happening at a different frequency. So um, I don't think that's a problem. Basically. Sure. Right, and the next question is uh, when you notice a spike uh, via um, acoustic emission indicating onset of fracture, how easy slash difficult is it to pinpoint that particular spot on an SCM? Well, I suppose it depends on um, whether whether that fracture is at the surface or not. So as, as I sort of hinted, the, the, guy, the um, Radim and, and, and uh, Hanzo in, in Olomoc, what they did is they they knew the exact point because it was correlated a certain distance along the track. They knew the exact point at which the fracture had occurred, but they couldn't see anything at all at the surface because in this case it was a subsurface crack. crack. And in this in this case, then they were able to um, do a focused iron beam cross section through that scratch track. And it was that that revealed the crack just at that point. If the crack is, um, I should say, it depends a little bit on mechanism. So if the crack is occurring from tensile stresses at the back of the probe, then that might be seen, on, well, that potentially is seen on the surface as well. So there you have a, you you would you would have access to that um, just through the sort of um, scratch data as well, just through the, the SEM as well. And I should also say that, um, because we're recording friction as well, the friction is very sensitive to the location of um, failure in a scratch test as well. So with a system as laterally rigid as the, as the nano test, it's really sensitive in terms of it combines this, lat this um, frictional signal that's really just picked up with, with fracture. It's not bending of the, of the probe just through topography or something. So. Um, you can detect essentially whether the friction is the failure is on the uh, the front of the probe, compressive, on the side of the probe, or it's tensile driven at the back of the probe. And you can correlate this with our um, you know, this is talk from another day, but uh, our modelling data that we have with SIO, um, which allow, which is also integrated capability within the NAT test. Great, and I think we have one final question: What are its immediate applications? Well, the, uh, the immediate applications of a tribo test, I think, I think we know, we know that in things like mobile phones, we know that um, sliding connectors do fail under relatively small numbers of cycles. So if we can design, for example, just things like that, where connectors on mobile phones that are, that are more durable, I think that's a clear win um, for, a low, for a low cycle. I mean, it's, it, um, that's an obvious thing. I think the biomaterials application is particularly interesting. As well, um, I can see a lot of stuff in terms of alloy development. Um, it, uh, it wasn't described, but I'm sure we could do it wet as well. If we were interested in doing it wet and looking at the tribochemistry, we could look at um, passivation, repassivation kinetics, for example. I know already at Southampton for single scratches and repetitive scratch tests a few years ago, they've looked at um, tissues, colleagues have looked at that. Um, but then there might be more potential to extend it towards that as well. So there's loads of applications for sure, but also within the um, coatings research, I think I think there's a lot of potential there because you can combine it with modeling as well. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Ben. And I think that's all our questions for, uh, for yourself. Um, so on that note, um, we want to thank our partner, uh, Micromaterials for supporting this webinar. Uh, we wanted to thank um, our speakers, um, uh, Dichu and uh, Ben. Um, we really appreciate this engaging talk and we appreciate you sharing. Um, so 
what we'd like to say is uh, please do visit our website. Um, we will organize the next webinar to follow uh, on, on the 24th of February. So please stay tuned on our website, emails and LinkedIn for further updates. We also have a fortnightly newsletter, which is Modern Surfaces. By signing up to our mailing list, you, you can receive this. Um, we also want to take the time to ask for your support uh, to advertise these lectures to your contacts. Um, so on that note, uh, we want to thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next time uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks and bye-bye.